personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast brought to you by Ammo.com. Now, when I was a little kid, I used to hate Davy Crockett because my friends would all tease me by singing that theme song. Now that I'm older and got a thicker skin, I love it. And I understand our (laughs) co-host wants to treat us to a little rendition of that sweet jam. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. You must have been tormented with that. I just, I had flashbacks. I just, I felt the urge to go run and hide and cry. <laughs> More than usual. Well, the real Davy Crockett is uh, not really much like the guy on the TV show. I don't, I did not find any independent verification that he had killed him a bar when he was only three. But oh. I did get the sense that he was what we may term a rugged individualist from an era when America was full of them uh, in the truest sense of the word. So he was born in Eastern Tennessee to pioneer parents in 1786. It's worth noting that uh, Eastern Tennessee is very much the frontier at that time. They eventually moved further West. And by the age of 12, he was in Western Tennessee. He was known kind of around those parts as a honest, hardworking boy, Good sense of humor. He learned how to shoot with his father around the age of eight. So if that bar was killed when he was only three, he must have done it with his bare hands, which I don't put past him. (laughs) And he enjoyed uh, going on hunting trips with his older brother. He ran away from home at the age of 13, which is more common than you would have thought during that era. I mean, you could, you know, so he, the, the impetus behind him running away from home uh, was that he was he got into a fight with a school bully right after he invo- enrolled in the school. And he didn't want to deal with his father when he got home, and he didn't want to deal with the bully the next day at school. So he just took off, and he worked as a farmer and a cattle driver and a hatter. A hatter, no less. Hatter was a very common profession around those times, yeah. So, I mean, you know, a lot of hats going on, uh, a lot of derbies during the settling of the West, That was an interesting thing. If you've seen Deadwood, the reason they all wear derbies is because derbies is actually the period correct cowboy hat. Not the, uh, not the Stetson, not the 10 gallon hat. It's the, it's the derby. That's the hat that won the West. I'm always disappointed when I learn historically accurate stuff. I'm just going to picture everyone wearing a big cowboy hat. Well, if it makes you feel any better, the actual translation for a penguin in Chinese is business goose. And that is a hundred percent true. So maybe that'll brighten your day a little as we learn that all the men on the plains, Clint Eastwood of the, uh, of the day would have been wearing a derby and not a 10 gallon hat. You telling me the commies are calling penguins business geese. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We should probably embrace their worldview. He did come back. He was 15. He indentured himself multiple times to pay off his father's debts. This was kind of the weird side of how childhood was in the the 18th and 19th century, was you could, like, indenture your child to pay off your debts. Hmm. Different different country. Uh, So he was kind of already starting to get himself entwined in in the threat of history and the threat of politics in America. Um, he is a myth and a folk hero today. Uh, I'm kind of less interested in, you know, drawing out the truth in some sort of boring and sterile way, but kind of showing us where the um, legend and the myth came from. So a day before his 20th birthday, Davy Crockett showed up on the front porch of 18 year old Polly Finley, and he insisted that they marry whether or not her parents would give their blessing. Her father did not want to miss the wedding and gave his approval. Uh, Pretty amazing as a 20-year-old kid to be mogging the Potterfamilius in such a way. But that's just (laughs) the kind of guy 
that Davy Crockett was. Again, this yeah. is all at of that the age. I couldn't have got a girl to go along with it, much less her parents. Yeah, I mean, this is like um, this was an age when boys were men. Really, I mean, it's it's pretty astonishing that he's able to survive at such a young age. It's a very different era, very much freer era, and such things were possible. In 1813, he enlisted and fought beside the militias during the War of 1812. He gathered a reputation as a scout and a hunter during the Creek War and helped to defeat the native population of the United States while also providing food for the entire regiment with nothing but a rifle. He's a real crack shot. That's a thing that a thread that kind of runs throughout his life, a thing that he's known for. He's 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 an expert marksman of the highest order. I mean, he's feeding, you know, an entire regiment with just a rifle. The frontier life was a hard one, and uh, this is true both him and Polly. Uh, in the spring of 1815, right after he returned from his second enlistment, she died at the age of 27, and he was very attached to her. He said that she was sweeter than sugar in his autobiography, written several years later, and as men did during that time when they were, uh, you know, financially stable and had young children and were widowed. He immediately married a widow who lived in nearby. This was again, one of these things that was very common during those periods. Uh, Davy Crockett was always known as a good public speaker, uh, a teller of tall tales, a raconteur. These were all things that could get you elected to the Tennessee state legislature in 1821. And if it sounds like I'm being um, smug or cheeky about this in any way, I actually think that it's awesome that that was what it took. It was just like retail politics to the nth degree, going out, pounding that dirt road, going knocking on doors, uh, getting some people together at the town square, telling some stories about how you killed a bar when you were only three. And that's going to get you uh, elected to the Tennessee state legislature. He, he started in local government. He was a justice of the peace and a county commissioner. I assume that those were incredibly powerful positions during that time period in as much as you were very close to the people that you were um, uh, governing, justice of the peace, would have had, I think, a significant amount of power in a small jurisdiction during that time period. And so he gets elected to the Tennessee State Legislature in 1821. In 1827, he goes to Washington in the House of Representatives. Pretty quick little career progression for that time period. You generally needed to bank a fair bit of experience at the local and state level before you would be elected to Congress during those days. It was very, very rare that you would go from, you know, uh, straight from justice of the peace to the uh, house of representatives, um, you know, and having these kinds of, uh, magistrate positions at the local level were very impressive resume during those years. He was uh, a frontiersman, He knew quite a bit about the backwoods. He had that kind of manner about him, which served him very well running from Tennessee, which again, if you uh, recall, is very much the frontier, very much log cabin country during this time period. And that kind of homespun style uh, was, uh, if, you know, if not sufficient or uh, necessary for political office, during those time periods. I mean, if you'll recall, this is the age of Jacksonian democracy is beginning and he has a uh, public image as a, as a kind of rough country man who brings that to the Congress. Um, he would talk a lot about hunting bear, all jokes about killing him a bar aside. He had the coonskin cap as he is known for having. And during his first term, he ran as a supporter of president Andrew Jackson, a man who I consider to be, the greatest man to ever be president of the United States. He served under him in a military capacity during the Creek War. And when he arrived in D.C., he worked as a spokesman 
for the frontiersmen who had elected him, trying to reduce taxes, settle land claims because uh, property rights, property issues are always a big deal around this time, uh, and protect the economic interests of the small freeholder. Three terms, he proposed multiple legislation. Most of these didn't get very far. He uh, tried to abolish the United States Milica Military Academy at West Point, which he considered to be a sort of uh, welfare program for uh, you know wealthy men to send their children to this publicly funded school. And thus he began to break from Jackson. He became a Whig later in his career and is the only member of the Tennessee delegation to vote against the Indian Removal Act, which was the first formal move away from, you know, a more respectful interaction with the Native Americans. Uh, this became the law in 1830 and authorized the president to basically remove tribes from ancestral lands west of the Mississippi River. And they did this, not pull any punches name in that act. No, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost, it's, I like, I like the transparency of it. I like that they didn't give it the, uh, you know, save the puppies act name. It's just, we're going to remove some Indians with this act of Indian removal. So Crockett received a letter of support from the chief of the Cherokee, a man named John Ross. Uh, I would love to know just how Cherokee John Ross was I'm dying to know because of the whole, uh, phenomenon of you know many uh, of these tribes at a certain point in history and i don't know if we're at it yet because i don't know enough about it but uh very 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 many tribes during the 19th century are if you look at particularly their tribal councils and tribal elders tend to be like scots irish guys mm. who somehow became tribal elders of you know whatever i mean you look at like go look at the tribal elders of wealthy casino tribes and uh they they don't look like pocahontas is all i'm saying in <laughs> many occasions but i don't know if that's accurate in this case um 1834 crockett lost to adam huntsman who had the backing of president jackson he was very frustrated and said that if he they did not want to elect him that he was going to go to texas which he did and so he joined a group of 30 men and moved to Texas, which again was not a part of the United States at that point. And that was uh, the last day that he saw one of his daughters, his daughter Matilda. And it was a three month trip to Texas with the volunteers that he was going with, drawing a crowd. People would come out to hear him do his rack on tour bit. And he was all also gaining a uh, reputation for a bit of a grandiose personality, a larger than life persona. Uh, he was a fervent advocate for Texas independence. Our Texas listeners will be happy to know. And he also kind of picks up around this time that America is very sympathetic with Texas, which would have certainly been true because many of the Texas revolutionaries and nationalists, separatists, however you want to call them, were Americans. And they, you know, there was a connection to the homeland. So he signed an oath to the provisional government of Texas in January of 1836 in return for promise of a substantial piece of land. And he arrived at the Alamo in San Antonio on February 8th. Uh, the Alamo, I, as far as I know, does not have a basement. And <laughs> okay, Pee Wee. <laughs> I went to the Alamo. I did not dare ask if they had a basement. They uh, must shoot you on sight if you ask that now. I didn't go for a walking tour either. I just like walked around the grounds of it. But it was, uh, you know, I I wasn't that impressed by it. Oh. Sorry. It just kind of was like an old building filled with tourists and the history of it's really cool, but I didn't get any, you know, special, like I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, filled with patriotism when I walked around the Alamo. Yeah. Well, Texans regard it very highly, but, uh, I understand it's not a physically impressive place. Yeah, it was, I, it was very strange. It was like kind of at the tail end of mask mania and, um, 
yeah, it was kind of whatever. I mean, maybe if I got a, a walking tour with like a tour guide, I would have been more into it. But in any event, uh, it is a small Adobe structure. It housed 250 to 300 people. That included enlisted men as well as volunteers who were following Jim Bowie, who had actually been sent by a Texas Army general, Sam Houston. We're getting all the big names in here. Uh, to dismantle and destroy the Alamo, which was said to be too difficult and dangerous to hold. But by the time Crockett arrives there, tensions are high. Uh, Travis and William Travis, the uh, the head of the enlisted soldiers and the head of the uh, volunteers, Jim Bowie is kind of coming to a head. But Crockett's able to diffuse the tensions between the two. Everybody's much more excited to be there. Spirits are lifted. And because there's a celebrity in the house uh, and a former congressman and a heck of a public speaker. So 30 30 or so pioneers that went with him uh, were known as being very, very accurate with the rifles and definitely a welcome addition to the Alamo. But, of course, on February 23rd, Santa Ana arrives with 6,000 troops and begins sieging the Alamo. And that is the thing that the Alamo is most known for, mm. other than the location of Pee Wee Herman's stolen, stolen bike. So they know they need reinforcements. Travis sends word to a local commander about 90 miles away, and he never even bothers to send word back. That's how little he wants to help. But uh, 50 men heard about it and went. Anyway, left his command and went to the Alamo. And um, Travis dramatically draws a line in the sword with a sign, line in the sand with a sword. It says, if anyone's willing to stay and fight to cross the line, all but one man did. Diana knew who that one man is, but I don't. And I'm not going to bother to look it up because it's not relevant to David Crockett. But the, the, the Santa Ana's forces famously attack. And within 90 minutes, the fight is over. Um, Seven men were taken prisoner and eventually executed. So everyone at the Alamo dies. And that's, you know, why it's the Alamo. They lit the body. They being the Mexican forces set the uh, bodies of the men on fire. About 800 men died. 200 of them were fighting for Texas. 600 for Mexico. Not a bad little casualty ratio there. Uh, No one knows where David Crockett was when he died at the Alamo. Uh, Some say it was the barracks. The Mexican army released the women, children, and slaves at the Alamo. And one slave reported that David Crockett's body was found uh, surrounded by 16 Mexican corpses with uh, Crockett's knife buried in his body. What that means, I'm not really sure. But the uh, mayor of San Antonio saw this and basically said that's what happened. Uh, Another competing claim is that he was one of the seven captured and executed men. Jose Enrique de la Pena, a mid-level officer in Santa Ana's army, wrote a diary uh, that was unearthed uh, many years later in 1955 and ultimately translated. And he says that Crockett surrendered and then was executed Another slave, corrobor- uh, another man who was a slave, corroborates the story. He told an American doctor that a red-faced man, who others called Cockett, was among the executed. Uh, Santa Ana never laid claim to this. Some historians believe that it would have been an excellent propaganda coup, and uh, that it's uh, not appearing in the historical record as a boast from Santa Ana. Draws the whole thing into a bit of question. He was, after his death, a giant martyr for the uh, cause of Texas independence. And this is really a thing that propelled it forward during the Texas Revolution. On April 21st, 1836, Sam Houston and his outnumbered forces were retreating towards the U.S. border, came across Santa Ana, and 1,400 of his men at San Jacinto, Jacinto. And this is where Houston attacks. Uh, yelling, remember the Alamo for the first time, allegedly like Hunter Biden. Uh, The Texans won the battle 
and captured Santa Ana. And that was really the end of the Texas Revolution because then they had a commanding general as a hostage and could kind of write their own ticket. And certainly Davy Crockett, you know, can we say would they have been yelling, remember the Alamo had Davy Crockett not been there? Uh, I, obviously, that's an impossible thing to, to determine, but uh, it is worth noting that he was there at this battle that becomes the rallying cry for the entire state of Texas during that time period. Uh, you know, certainly there were a lot of leading figures of the Texas Revolution at the Alamo, Davy Crockett being one of them, but Davy Crockett had also been a national political figure before this. So to me, this begs the question, is, is America ever going to produce another man like this? Someone no. Who, someone who had served as a politician and will be perceived as a hero universally. Uh, no. No. Universally is the is the word that kills that. No. Had, had anyone not. disparaged Crockett or disliked him? I mean uh, – well, I'm sure that the the you know hardcore Jacksonians would have, but um, you know the Whig Party that he was a member of was uh, did not have a lot of um, specific political principles. It was largely based around disliking Andrew Jackson, particularly at the beginning. It was like any kind of petty or personal grievance you had against Andrew Jackson was enough for you to become a Whig, and there were certainly a lot of people who felt that he had that they had been wronged by him. It's very difficult to find a um, consistent kind of politics that runs through the Whig party. Um, an interesting thing about the Whigs is that of there were four Whig presidents and uh, two of them died in office and the other two were fill- fulfilling the term of the guy who died. So we tend to think of them as having a much bigger footprint, particularly on presidential politics than they actually did. But um, it'd be great if we had a modern candidate, a modern Whig candidate whose entire platform was hating on Andrew Jackson. See how far he could go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not really it's he's interesting because he gives that he's it's I mean, the, the, the more heroic stuff about him is obviously the, the, there and we should celebrate that. But the, the, one of the things that's interesting to me about him is how he's such a man of his time. You know, running away from home at 13, uh, joining the Jackson movement when that's kind of the hot ticket in town, and then exiting it out as the, you know, the, the base of the Whig party was small tradesmen, small farmers, the frontier, um, free labor kinds of stuff, you know, not not terribly hostile to the planter class, but like. Uh, not for them, you know, is maybe the the best way of putting it. And where the planter class is kind of understood as a larger landholders who owned many slaves it was not an anti-slavery party by any stretch of the imagination. It was not an anti-slavery. Uh, it was not even a you know, free soil party. It, it would have it made no real attacks on slavery as an institution, but very much represented people who were free labor, uh, you know, small business owners and small landholders who would have owned, you know, maybe one or two slaves, um, kind of just a common broad common folk party in a way that we don't really have in the United States, uh, past the Whig party, but it's common. And there's parties like this in Europe, like uh, if anybody knows anything about Irish politics, Finna Foyle is similar to the Whig Party in that they're just kind of like populist in the sense of, you know, well, what do people want? We'll give it to them. Um, yeah. So I'm not like that's that's one of the things that makes him interesting to me and his trek across the country, starting on the frontier when it's in eastern Tennessee, uh, going so far into the frontier that he's in another country, you know. Uh, making that transition, I think, is a very, very interesting fact about him and a thing that really places him firmly in a certain type of America and a certain type of American. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I really like that aspect about him, that he's very much a man of his time. He's skilled in the skills that are necessary to kind of be a free man around those times, his skill with a rifle, 
being one uh, man of many hats, including Hatter, you know, knowing how to do all kinds of different stuff, not being able to afraid to go out on your own. You don't like the politics where you are. You pick up and move and start over with a group of men around you who are helping you to do the same. I think this is, you know, the type of man that, that won the West. And I think that that's why we continue to look to him today. I think it's why he would have, you know, had a TV show and kids were wearing coonskin caps and stuff like that. That was always on during the, the same time. If you were sick from school, you'd stay home. You'd watch Price of Right, Lassie, Dennis the Menace, Davy Crockett, Gunsmoke, and then your mom would give you a green liquid and you would forget what happened for the next three hours. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, is the staying power is like, you know, the TV show, is, which I've seen a bunch of episodes of. My father loves it. Um, you know, the fact that the show had staying power, it was a show from the 50s, but it was a show that had staying power into the 80s because you and I remember this being on. And it would have yeah. been on if people didn't want to watch it. Yeah, that's why I thought, you know, back in the old days, everything was just in black and white because uh, it just made sense. If you find yourself in San Antonio and you want to go visit Davy Crockett, he is in the San Fernando Cathedral. There's a memorial reading. Here lies the remains of Travis Crockett Bowie and other Alamo heroes formerly buried in the sanctuary of the old San Fernando Church. Exhumed July 28, 1936. Exposed to the public view a year later. Entombed May 11, 1938. The Archdiocese of San Antonio erected this memorial May 11, A.D. 1938, R.I.D. And I like going to graves. I don't know if you guys do, but I think it's a cool little thing to do when you're in a city. Find out if somebody famous is buried there. Go give them a visit. Write them a letter. Whatever you like to do. Uh, but he had fewer than 100 days of formal education in his life. Uh, so much the worse for formal education. I think it's vastly overrated. I think that men like Davy Crockett show us why. Uh, and 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 a man who was a legend, not just after he was dead, but uh, and a man who was a legend in his own time, in the true sense of the word, of having a mystery and aura of myth and mythology about him. And I think that that's why we're talking about him right now. I think it's an easy thing to kind of gloss over. Oh, yeah, Davy Crockett, you know, killed him a bar when he was only three. I've heard this story I don't know how many times, but... I think that he really is representative of a certain type of America that does not exist anymore and probably will never exist again, but that we can uh, look to for what the values of America are today. And one of those is marksmanship. And if you want to get good, you got to dump a lot of rounds. So you should go to ammo.com forward slash podcast, where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. I know that the great caliber shortage is still going on. I, I, I try and pick some stuff up every now and again. And being on the road, I, I can't order uh, ammunition to the mail. And I notice that a lot of places do not have nine, do not have 223, uh, do not have these kinds of common calibers that people are looking to really hone their skill with at this time. You certainly should. So you should go to ammo.com forward slash podcast where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. As I always say, if we're out, come back in a day or two. We restock common and uncommon calibers very, very quickly. So if you need your 308, your 9mm, your 44 mag, 40, 45, you know, whatever it is you're looking for, 38 special, please do come check it out. If we don't have it, come back in a couple of days. This has been the Resistance Library Podcast. As always, for Dave Trello, this is Sam Jacobs, and we'll see you next time.